whole new global talk show, News Talent. Let's meet our panelists. On October the 12th, the Korean Education Ministry announced government plans to take control of history textbooks for middle and high schools. The current system allows schools to choose one of eight private publications approved by the government. But this will be changed to a single government authorization system. Starting from 2017, schools will teach from the new state published history textbooks. Amid the heated debate among civic groups, academia, and the rival parties, the ruling's Henori party says the new initiative will correct the leftist ideology contained in the current textbooks. The main opposition, New Politics Alliance for Democracy, has expressed great concern over standardizing history education. Educators and historians remain skeptical and have declared that they will be boycotting the writing of state-issued history textbooks. Some people in academia have expressed their support for the government's plan. The public debate is becoming increasingly heated with concerns over political neutrality from the opposing groups and leftist ideology from the supporting groups. The government's plan to reinstate state published history textbooks has been subject to significant international attention from foreign media. Although the decision has been finalised to issue these textbooks, the controversy is expected to continue. Right, so this issue is causing a lot of fierce reaction, some polarising views. Uh, we'll be getting into the debate in just a little bit. But first up, as foreign correspondents, you must have read quite a bit about Korean history. Um, are there any books or papers in particular that stood out to you? I think for me, one of the earliest books I, I read about Korean history was from the the, his, the American historian Bruce Cummings in uh, Korea's Place in the Sun. Mm. I mean, it was a really great background about you know starting from you know ancient times, you know throughout the like the, the, the Three Kingdoms period, the Chosun Dynasty, the colonial period, mm -hmm. you know, the, the war until the present day, the, the division of Korea. Uh, it was a, a really great and informative book. Okay. Any others? Well, I would like, I would have liked that book called The Two Koreas. It's very good. It's about uh, Korean contemporary history. Mm. I would recommend, to, recommend it to people to, to get some knowledge about, uh, you know, these last decades in, in Korea. Okay. I could add uh, two more that I really liked. One was uh, by Andrei Lenkov, a Russian historian, about the failure of destalinization in North Korea. Okay. And I like as well a book by uh, Pak Tae-gyun, which is a historian from Seoul National University. It's pretty right. interesting too. I'm actually reading a really interesting novel right now called The Girl Who Wrote Loneliness by South Korean novelist Shin Gyung Suk. And I, you know, I like reading all of the kind of historical books that my colleagues mentioned, but I also think that fiction is an interesting way of learning about history because it has a, a kind of humanizing element that mm. uh, history doesn't always have. So this book was originally published uh, in Korean in 1995, and its English translation just came out uh, very recently. Right. And it's a semi-autobiographical work of uh, this novelist's time working in, as a, in a factory in Guro Digital Complex. And so it's, that's an important episode in Korean history of uh, you know, 
people coming from rural areas to cities to take paid work in factories, generally low wage work where the, the working conditions weren't always great. And so reading about this uh, period, this important period in Korean history from a novel has a way of bringing across the kind of texture and the human experience mm. of the time in a way that uh, conventional history doesn't always accomplish. Okay, so that's an interesting take, a uh, different way of showing Korea's history. Yeah. But basically, the Korean government is trying to take control over history education in the country. What are your thoughts on this issue? Do you think it's okay for the government to take this kind of authorization over the children's education? Or do you think it's unreasonable? I'm opposed to it. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a way of young people to be exposed to different ways of interpreting this country's history and having different opportunities to explore other ways of imagining what happens. And I mean, also, I think as we've seen in, in the debate over this issue, there's not a strong consensus over A, what contemporary Korean history actually is, mm -hmm. you know, like what actually happened, and also how that should be interpreted, how that should be remembered. Should certain points of the country's history be remembered as triumphs over difficult odds, or should they be remembered as, should they be kind of mourned as tragic periods where mm -hmm. a lot of people suffered? These are still very much open questions, and it Indeed. seems to me that the government is trying to shut down this debate by taking control and advancing only one narrative. I think this debate needs to continue and more voices need to be heard. I mean, I think that's, I mean, I think this is reflective of the overall polarization in Korea that's gone on way longer than this textbook issue. I mean, I, I think as journalists, we have seen that, you know, if we go to interview well-known Korean academics, depending on what school they teach at, uh, you know, who they are, like, they often are affiliated with, they have a political bias. Like, there's, I don't get a sense there are a lot of neutral observers here in Korea. Mm. So, I mean, there will, there will always be people asserting that that historian comes from the leftist persuasion, or that one is a conservative. Uh, there's, there's very few in between, there's very few observers, historians that are in the middle that don't have some sort of influence uh, from a political affiliation. So, I mean, it seems like a very gray area because, I mean, history is inherently pretty gray because it's usually written by the victors. Sure. Well, today we will be discussing uh, probably one of the biggest controversies of the year. Yeah. Um, it's causing heated debate amongst politicians as well as the electorate. Uh, and the opposing parties are deeply divided against the state control of history textbooks. We'll be discussing South Korea's history textbook controversy today. There are other countries as well who follow a similar system. Which countries do you know that issue a state? I mean, I can mention France. Uh, France, we do have a certain level of, like the government does have a certain level of control on the textbook through a committee. Uh, it's a mixed committee of experts and historians. Mm. And actually this year, in France too, we have this huge controversy about the content of a history textbook. Right. Uh, there is a debate between some people saying that there is too much teaching on Islam and they wish there would be more teaching on Christianity. Uh, there is some people that say that there is too much emphasis, emphasis on um, the guilt uh, and the, like colonization mistakes or colonization uh, crimes by France, mm -hmm. uh, where they say, oh, instead we should teach about enlightenment and renaissance and the glorious period of our history. And that we see as a, a bit similar as in Korea, a polarization between conservative, nationalistic view and more like liberal, open-minded. Mm -hmm. And I think the very fact that we have a controversy in France now shows we are in the middle of some, some kind of an identity crisis. Right. And probably that's happening in Korea too. Okay. In Spain, well, we, we invaded uh, America like uh, uh, a bit more than 500 years ago. And Water uh, under the bridge. Uh? <laughs> <laughs> Long ago. Well, whatever. We, the, the thing is that we, we discovered, we invaded America <laughs> 500 years ago. And, uh, the, but there is no controversy in the textbooks between liberals, liberals and conservatives. In Spain, we have a very divided society, just as in mm -hmm. Korea, like between left and right. But still in the textbooks, we, we uh, study both sides. We studied that we discovered and invaded America, and we, we were a big uh, uh, powerhouse at that time, but also we study how uh, how did we kill the native people and and all the bad things we did to them. And I think everybody uh, really agrees that we we did those uh, two things, right? That on one side just uh, doing that uh, big improvement, and the other side uh, doing, uh, doing those morally uh, wrong things. So I, I think there's no 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 problem with that in my country. Okay. 
Okay, well, in Korea, uh, currently most history textbooks are written by a panel of scholars and school teachers as well. What about in your native countries? We've talked about France, a little bit about Spain as well. What about in North America? Uh, in, in the U.S., especially in the state of Texas over the past couple years, there mm. have been uh, repeated controversies about putting too much uh, emphasis on the supposed uh, Christian origins of the founding fathers of the United States. Right. And there's also controversy that always arises in regard to the history of slavery in the mm -hmm. U.S. Just recently, a history book publisher uh, left a caption refer in one of its history books referring to slaves as workers. Uh, that's making a stretch. Now, mm. uh, an apology was issued and amendments to that or stickers to be placed over that caption. Uh, were sent out to school districts. So even, you know, in, there's an interesting article in The Atlantic uh, that I read that said that it's kind of the market forces that causes these problems because yeah. publishers, they kind of want to water down some of the history, especially in regard to slavery or the U.S. Civil War that happened 150 years ago, so that southern states will buy their textbooks. That So they, they downplay the role of slavery in the Confederate breakoff from the Union, mm. uh, these kind of things. So in, in that case, uh, you know, it's not the government causing problems, it's actually private companies that are causing historical discrepancies. So it's interesting that even with a range of textbooks in America, in the US, you still get this kind of sweeping towards the left or the right or, you know, the religious standpoint of the various states. How about in Canada? Is it similar? Yeah, uh, I think Canada is a system that's similar to the US and to what Korea has had until this point. Um, but one benefit of Canadian history is that it's really kind of boring. <laughs> so there's not, a, there's not a, like a real like passionate amount of disagreement over like what happened and like, hey, what didn't happen. You guys burnt down the White House. <laughs> yeah, well then that's one thing that all Canadian children should learn and be proud of. <laughs> um, but and another thing to keep in mind about Canada is that Canada is an immigrant society. Like in my hometown in Toronto, roughly half of Torontonians weren't born there. Mm. So when you have like this number of like newcomers to a society, you don't have as many people who have like really passionate connections to that country's history. I think a lot of Canadians, you know, still feel kind of tied to their their countries of origin. Mm -hmm. But uh, one thing I would say is that the the Canadian government that was recently just voted out in the election, they had been trying to alter the narrative of Canadian history, and they had been trying to emphasize Canada's uh, military and uh, the role of Canadian, Canada's military in its past and kind of like depicting the military as this glorious thing mm. and trying to water down the, Canada's uh, identification as a peacekeeping nation. So okay. that's just one reason that I'm glad that this government and is that was no the conservative power. government. Yeah, that was, was that? Conservative. And what about the independence from Quebec? Like, do people there try to emphasize more on the French, the French history or their own history, that kind of struggle? Yeah, well, and I mean, they have their own French language textbooks. So, I mean, the, I, don't, I don't know what's in those because I never studied from them. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think definitely they... There's a huge emphasis in Quebec on uh, emphasizing their unique identity. Okay. And I th the change that's occurred over the past 20 years or so is I think that there's not so much of an independence movement in Quebec anymore. Mm. Uh, the, Co the Quebecois movement has changed more to just emphasizing its difference within the Canadian system okay. and just wanting to be acknowledged as unique and as distinct within the system instead of wanting to leave and create okay. their own. I think in the United States you've had a couple books out in the past 30 years that have really shaken up the education system in regard to teaching history. You have Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States that came out in the early 80s that really, you know, cast a negative light on what is left out of American history textbooks. Again, uh, in regard to slavery, race, uh, labor, uh, and that caused reform in how publishers make their history books. And you had another book that came out, I believe, in the mid-90s, uh, The Lies My Teacher Told Me, uh, that also uh, revealed a lot of, you know, about uh, uh, Columbus's conquest of the new land, you know, how, uh, you know, that American history textbooks have always mythologized uh, the founding fathers. and. Uh, didn't look at them as human beings and, you know, kind of gave the notion that history is something that's untouchable and didn't place what was happening hundreds of years ago into context that's more relatable to students today. Well, one thing more in Spain, we have that problem of uh, regionalism. Uh, there are some uh, 
uh, regions in the country that they want to be independent and they have a big power of uh, self-government. So they, they have a big influence on the textbooks and they change the, the original textbooks and they, they make them be a way to study more the, the story of their region and, and tell um, historical views that can be a little bit biased about, about how their region uh, should be independent or should be like different than Spain. They try to hide uh, the achievements of Spain in the history. So there is uh, kind of a controversy these days about mm. that issue. Okay. The government's move has, of course, sparked fierce criticism, not just amongst other politicians, but also students and teachers as well. So let's hear what they have to say. よ즘역사가요많이그말이많고바뀌고있는데좀교과서마다다르니까좀오류도있고좀외국등이현실적으로좀 또 이게 잘못된 기준이라는 거를 또 바로 알려줄 수 있는 또 다른 관점이 있어야지. 그러니까 역사를 보는 다양한 관점들이 사라지니까 그 하나만으로 역사를 다 해석할 수 없다고 생각하거든요. 그 다양성 그런 것이 다 없어지고 오히려 편협한 시간만 간다고 생각하면 좀 말이 안 되는 생각합니다. 역사교과서는 학생들을 위해서 만든 교과서이기 때문에 어른들보다 더 학생들한테 국정교과서가 아무래도 큰 영향을 끼치고 자신의 미래에 대한 그런 영향이 더 많이 끼치니까 저희 민족의 장점을 잘 학생들이 배울 수 있었으면 좋겠어요. 음 그냥 솔직하게 잘못한 건 잘못했다고 받아들이는 그 태도? 그냥 학생들한테 제대로 된 사실을 알려주는 거 그러니까 우리나라 역사 그대로 가르쳐 주는 게 좋다. 네, 그런 거라고 생각해요. 진짜로 제대로 알고 있는 사람들이 제대로 알리기 위해서 만든 교과서가 올바르게 있지 않나. Right, so the students are pretty invested in this issue. It's obviously they're the ones that are going to be studying this textbook mm -hmm. and they're the ones that are going to be leading our society in a few years time. What were your reactions to the students' comments? They are smart. They are mm. smart kids smarter than uh, many comments I heard so far. <laughs> 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 well, what stood out to me was the repeated uses of words like correct and accurate. Mm. Like the, the, that was the one kid, thing that stood out yeah, to me Yeah, the kids well. also like, well, we, you know, we should have books that present things correctly. We should have books that provide an accurate representation of history. But, but what is correct? What is correct and what is accurate is, is really what we're here to talk about today. I mean, people can't really agree on what that is. I mean, I think one cultural difference uh, between what's happening here in Korea and let's say in the United States is that I think students are much more interested in this whole controversy. I can't imagine students in the United States <laughs> uh, <laughs> protesting yes. or going on TV to talk about the how they're upset that, you know, uh, McGraw-Hill, like one of the publishers, <laughs> is making textbooks that water down, you know, the history of slavery. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I do admire the fact that people are much more invested here in mm -hmm. South Korea about, you know, sorting out this mess than yeah. they would be in other countries. I mean, I think one of the reasons is that, you know, Korea is technically still a country at war. Um, and the huge ideological differences between North and South Korea, um, I think, is another issue. Um, and, you know, some people say that correcting this ideological bias is one of the most or one of the key issues, one of the critical elements in this controversy. Um, do you think it's right for Korean or South Korean textbooks to refer to and explain the idea of Chuche? Well, Juche is a, a set of North Korean ideas, ideas that are often attributed to founding and deceased leader Kim Il-sung. Mm -hmm. And I think if you were to ask all four of us and you were to ask everyone 
in this country what it is, you would get a different answer every single time. Because okay. You would ask, not, if you ask every North Korean, I think they would give, <laughs> yeah, give there, a different answer. So right too. now it's not very well explained. There's a new book out by the North Korea analyst Brian Myers, The Juche Myth. Uh, that pretty much you know puts this all down. That Juche is just a bunch of aphorisms that mean nothing. It's like that book, The Secret. It's it's a it's a lot of just kind of good talk and you know nonsense that uh, is you know contrived to actually be some sort of philosophy. North Korea is not going to win any supporters here in South Korea if there was a critical and open discussion mm. about what North Korea stands for. I, I agree with my colleague. And uh, if you don't want to teach Juche, if you prohibit teaching what is North Korean ideology, then you make it mysterious and you make it interesting. Right. And you make it, oh, I want to know. If they hide mm. me something, I want to. Well, it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous ideology. No, of course, if you teach North Korean system, then you should teach what is Juche. Mm -hmm. And then there is, no, there is no mystery anymore and you don't make it valuable. And also, the, the, it's, it's because of the right of the students to know the truth and to know mm -hmm. the, the political background and the historical background of, of the country that they are living in, right? It's a divided country and it, it comes from a, from a, a wider uh, historical issue that was the Cold War and then the, the Korean War, whatever. And if they don't learn what's going on in, in North Korea and what, how North Korean th people think, they have a gap in their knowledge, in the history knowledge there. So I think they have the, the right to know what's going on in North Korea and what are the historical facts and, uh, and the, histor and, and the uh, basis of the regime of North Korea. All right, so our panel gives middle and high school students some more credit than uh, <laughs> I think some people do. I mean, as we saw in our video, they deserve more credit. Yeah, they're free-thinking people, you know, they they're, not, they're not silly. Like, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. All right, well, it looks like the history textbook debate uh, is causing a bit of a battle between the conservative and liberal camps. We saw some representatives <laughs> in the earlier video. So zooming out a little bit from the South Korean history textbook controversy, um, let's talk about general historical education. What can we do to improve this? Well, I'm no academic policy advisor, mm. but you know, I, I think kind of as we've alluded to earlier, uh, having a panel in which you would have academics representing, you know, a diverse uh, backgrounds, I think, in reaching a consensus upon how to uh, portray a country's history. I mean, I to me that seems like the most ideal situation in, mm -hmm. in producing a historical textbook. I, mean, I, I really think that we need to teach history as a kind of moving and living thing. Mm. Like, it's, I think it's somewhat misguided to want to teach history as like this is a set of facts like learn these and memorize them. Like the important thing is teaching, I, th I said this earlier, is like teaching young people how to think and teaching them to be able to analyze and to come up with their own interpretations of things. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to ease the emphasis a little bit on, you know, what is the correct view? Like what is, well, you know, what really happened? We need to teach things from a variety of perspectives and, you know, encourage a kind of uh, engagement with this. I agree with Stephen, and, and what I think is that they uh, they should take care a lot of uh, they should take care a lot with the with the history book and just try to provide more data, less interpretation, but uh, promote a lot the debate between mm -hmm. the students. So if you give them the data and they can debate about it, I think that would be a good uh, starting point. So I think our panel mostly thinks that we should give some facts, leave students to research more for themselves, and come to their own conclusions as to what happened. All right, well, it's generated some heated debate amongst our panel today as well. So shall we wrap up with our final headlines? Leave history to the historians. Short and snappy. Okay. I, knew I, was, I knew you guys were going to get that. So exactly. I would say keep history free from politics. OK, OK. I, I would say history is a living thing. Learn it from all angles. Wide perspective. Uh, I would say um, teaching uh, education issues should be left to scholars. It's a little bit similar to what uh, Jason said, but mm -hmm. I really want to emphasize this. So. Okay. Well, let's hope that in the end, uh, this debate leads to a better and less biased history textbook for Korea students that encourages discussion and critical thinking as well. I hope you enjoyed yourselves, guys. We did. We did. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your insightful comments this week, as usual. And join us next week, viewers, for a whole new global talk show, News Tell Us.
We will be open for any opinions or requests on our official website as well as our Facebook page. We are nearing the end of 2015 already. Time has wow. absolutely flown by. There have been a lot of big news stories this year. Which ones have been most memorable? Mokbang. Mokbang. <laughs> <laughs> of course. For me, I think it was a separated family issue. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the most emotional and sad. The most sad is the, the family reunion. As journalists, we can actually meet the people who are involved in right, that right. kind of story. I mean, both Koreas that they mm -hmm. had at the end of August, it was like a very spicy issue. Just like your sweater. <laughs> <laughs> 